Good evening and welcome to the Cinema of Deutsches Film Museum here in our accompanying series to our current big jubilee exhibition Kubrick's 2001 50 years of a space odyssey. The exhibition uh, lasts until the 23rd of September and if you haven't had the chance to visit it I strongly recommend it to you of course and there are more upcoming events in our accompanying series as well. Um, we also have a special brochure for that. Um, you can check out the upcoming um, events. For example, we will have only in two weeks a talk with uh, Fabiano Pinto of Physikalischer Verein based here in Frankfurt um, about observing the stars in comparison to Kubrick's 2001. This month is also a very special month in our accompanying series because in August we celebrate Stanley Kubrick's entire oeuvre with a retrospective including 10 feature films by Stanley Kubrick. So you have the opportunity again to see rare Kubrick films on the big screen here in this cinema in rare 35 and 70 millimeter prints. Tonight I would like to introduce you to our very special guest. We are honored uh, to have Professor Dr. Dominic Jaynes here of Kiel University who will talk about A Queer Future 2001, A Space Odyssey. Let me start with a personal remark. Back uh, two years ago in 2016 when I gave a paper at the Stanley Kubrick conference in Leicester that was organized by James Fenwick, Kubrick expert Peter Kramer from the University of East Anglia in Norwich asked me uh, for the text he had longed for so many years in Kubrick and especially 2001 studies, a text that I've quoted in my paper about um, a gender approach and a queer reading of 2001. And that text, of course, was a brilliant paper by Dominic Jaynes entitled Clark and Kubrick's 2001, A Queer Odyssey. That brilliant paper was first published in 2011, a new approach, a new reading, a gender and queer studies reading to 2001, that classic back from 1968. And it was first published in 2011 in volume four, issue one of the science fiction film and television um, uh, literature. And uh, luckily it has just recently been reprinted in the edited collection, Understanding Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey, Representation and Interpretation, a wonderful book edited by James Fenwick, whom I just mentioned, and published by Intellect Books in Bristol just two months ago. So in this book you will find um, Dominic Jane's paper again, which I think is the basis for tonight's talk also. Uh, will the future be gender fluid and queerly sexually, uh, sexual, sorry, as Dominic Jane's. In his talk he will argue that 2001 can be understood as a very queer odyssey. It begins by situating the film in the context of the careers of the author Arthur C. Clarke and uh, the director Stanley Kubrick of course. Clark is shown to have been a homosexual or bisexual who explored same-sex desires in a number of his fictions, whilst Kubrick, on the other hand, um, is discussed as having a fascination with problematizing normative masculinity and asserting, by contrast, the potency of his artistic and arguably perverse per personal vision. Dominic Jaynes is a professor of modern history at Keele University in the UK. And uh, I'm sorry again for the delay that we have to start a little bit later tonight because of the weather situation, the bad weather condition this afternoon. Frankfurt Airport was closed for a couple of minutes. So we are very proud and very happy that Dominic James made all his way from the UK uh, for us tonight. Um, Dominic is also um, a cultural historian. He studies text and visu visual images since the 18th century. Within his sphere, he focuses on the histories of gender, sexuality, and religion. His most recent books are Picturing the Closet, Male Secrecy and Homosexual Visibility in Britain, published by Oxford University Press, Visions of Queer Murderdom, University of Chicago Press, and Oscar Wilde Prefigured, Queer Fashioning and British Caricature, published by the University of Chicago Press. We're very proud to have you here tonight, Dominic. Thank you for coming to us, and please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Dominic James. <laughs> 
Uh, so, and again, thank you very much for that um, uh, that excellent sort of introduction. And again, let me add my apologies for the slight sort of slow running uh, to get this get this going. I was told that there were great storms across this area of Germany, and when I get here, there was no evidence of storms. But anyway, I, who am I to know? Uh, so, um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be uh, talking you through part of the material from that paper that, uh, that you've heard talked about already and I'm going to be contextualizing that with some additional background material and particularly some additional imager images. Um, I've kept the images very simple, they're just simple stills um, and um, because we have a sort of a limited um, amount of, of time here um, but I'm very I'll be delighted to take some questions at the end. And uh, one thing I would just say is clearly when you come along to a talk like this, you're expecting that you're going to have someone who will have expertise, and I do have expertise. The focus of my expertise is, as you've heard, gender, sexuality, visual culture, um, and about the ways in which sexualities can be expressed or concealed. The centre of my expertise is not, in fact, Stanley Kubrick. So there will be things about Kubrick, there will be many things about Kubrick that I do not know, OK? Um, so I've, I, in a sense, when I wrote that paper, I wrote it as someone who has been watching uh, Kubrick films all the way through my, well, maybe not when I was four, but you know, essentially from my teenage years onwards, and was fascinated by them and curious about them because they seemed to offer something, a sort of a different vision. Um, and when I started thinking about what was different about Kubrick's vision, I started to think to myself, is there something odd about Kubrick's vision? Is there something strange about it? And one of the key things, and you may well be well aware of this, about the term queer as used within um, Anglophone studies is that it's not just the same thing as lesbian homosexual. It can be a much wider sense of a, a troubling, uh, a presentation of alternatives to the mainstream, which tie in in some way to resonances of gender and sexuality. And I'm certainly one of those people who thinks that you can't really pull, well, it's best not to try and pull gender and sexuality apart in an analysis. So when I'm saying that 2001 can be seen as a queer odyssey. I'm not saying to you, you have to see it as a queer odyssey. This is very much presented as a reading, one in a set of different readings. Um, hopefully one that's going to be provoking for you and thought provoking. Um, and also one which questions the position of say, uh, homosexuality in relation to this film. Now, one of the things that we need to do in relation to go about a study like that is to think about the context, the historical context, what's going on in the 1960s. Um, and so you can have two different forms of reading. One of them, which looks at this film as a kind of artefact that's outside of its historical context and how it's actually built up and and so forth. Um, but that's not actually what I'm focusing on. What I'm focusing on is the conditions of its production and what those might actually tell us or help to inform us about what is in fact in front of us. Because one of the things that I think is very important about 2001 is that it's not a film that clearly explains for you what it is actually about. So it leaves it, an awful lot of things are left up to you to conjecture and to think through. So let's think about that. Let's keep an, uh, a, a mind uh, that is open to possibilities, possibilities of gender and sexual alternatives.
Um, I'm also going to be trying to um, remind myself um, that you are one ahead of me uh, to a considerable extent in that I do not speak German. Uh, you probably are going to be second language speakers in English, so I will keep my pace reasonably moderate. <clears throat> um, but um, um, what that may mean is that we get through slightly less of the material depending upon how the time actually goes. Okay. So I want to start by situating 2001 in the wider context of the artistic careers of Hearst Clarke and then Kubrick. Uh, one of the things I should also should have said in my introduction is that I'm reading off my laptop here. So, you know, you're going to have this sort of slight odd sense of I look at you and then I sort of look away like this, but there's no avoidance of that. There will be some nice pictures to distract you. Um, okay. I want to start by situating 2001 in the wider context of the artistic careers of first Clark and then Kubrick. Clark had been married, although apparently with rather less emotional and sexual success than Oscar Wilde had had in that direction. And the reason why I make that point is that Oscar Wilde is often seen as, you know, a prototypical gay man, but he was actually married lived with his wife quite happily for a number of years and fathered two children. So seeing Oscar Wilde as queer, for example, is a useful sort of step because it means that we think beyond a sort of precise categories of homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual. So Clark may also be rather queer as well. Clark met Marilyn Torgensen uh, in, on the 28th of May 1953 and three weeks later they were married. Uh, within a month, the marriage was apparently in trouble. A sense of his priorities can be gained from the fact that his novel Childhood, Childhood's End um, okay, from his novel Childhood's End 1954 was dedicated to Marilyn for quotes, letting me read the proofs on our honeymoon. So, you know, what, what might you do on your honeymoon? Perhaps, instead of spending the time in the marital bed, you spend it with the proofs of this book, which is actually quite queer in some ways, which I'll go on to talk about. Marilyn said of Clark's attitude to marriage that it was almost like a hobby he did not want to get into. You have to think about the pressures in the early 1950s, the very, very homophobic period. By 19, for Christmas 1953, they had separated, and Clark later said that it proved that he was, quote, not the marrying type. The marriage was legally dissolved uh, in December 1964 on the grounds of a deep and fundamental incompatibility left unspecified. Shortly before his death, at the time when he was due to receive a knighthood, uh, Clark was the subject of a homophobic campaign in the British press. It was alleged that not only had Clark had a long-term companion in Sri Lanka, which is where he, he lived in his final years, uh, Michael Mike Wilson, but also that the two had been involved in paedophilia. And one thing to be aware of here is uh, sometimes an aggressive um, confusion uh, amongst people who want to be hostile about these things between homosexuality and 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 paedophilia, which simply means you know a, a, attraction, of course, to uh, to children rather than being same sex or different sex differentiated. On the 1st of February 1998, the Daily Mirror, which is a tabloid newspaper, published Child Sex Shame of Arthur C. Clarke, saying that the novelist had, quotes, confessed to paying for sex with boys for the 40 years that he had been living in Sri Lanka, and that he was widely discussed on the web as being, quotes, a long-time closet case. The campaign appeared to have been aimed at forestalling the award from the Queen, from the award of the knighthood. The crucial point here is that an award of a knighthood is a major sign of sort of respectability. And traditionally speaking, there's quite a long history in Britain of uh, men who were uh, perhaps gay uh, not being awarded knighthoods until just before they died. So, in other words, the idea that they might be a bit too old to get around to having any major scandals, and if it hadn't come out by then, it was safe to give them, safe to give them a knighthood. So it's a similar kind of thing. You wait till they're really, really old, and then you're fine. Fine. 
Okay. Um, so, and I think Clark, in many ways, had been effectively been kind of outed. In the guarded New York Times obituary of 2008, it commented that Mr. Clark's standard answer when journalists asked him outright if he was gay was, no, merely mildly cheerful. And, of course, that's playing on the fact that the before gay meant homosexual in English, it meant happy. Um, and that was the term that was widely used. The meaning of the word gay meant essentially happy through, uh, really, until gay liberation kind of wrenched the word to a new meaning in the 1970s. So he's kind of playing on that. But, of course, people will know this if they're sophisticated in reading the New York Times. Um, and so this phrase, I'm just mildly cheerful, is not, one supposes, meant to fool the newspaper's sophisticated readership. Uh, and indeed, you know, there is a long history of um, coded references to deviant desire in obituary columns for those who want to enjoy that subgenre of literary, liter uh, literary culture. So even if he remained substantially in the closet, Clark had, from the time with his collaboration with Kubrick, began to make increasingly open gestures towards exploring homosexual themes in his fiction. Um, and there are a number of these, for example, um, in his Songs of Distant Earth project. And there are enough mm, implicitly gay or bisexual characters in Clark's fiction uh, to generate uh, reasonably substantial entries in, you know, queer sci-fi um, encyclopedias, for example, Uranian Worlds. And if you're interested, you, you can look up his books, Imperial Earth, Songs of Distant Earth, and 2061. Um, okay. So it seems clear from all of this that Clark was at least bisexual, if not homosexual. Again, definitely, I think we can say queer. And that his contribution to the 2001 project represented a stage in the elaboration of his sexual feelings in his fiction. But what about his collaborator? Now, what I want to think about here, and this is one of the reasons why um, I was keen for this to be paired with Full Metal Jacket, is that I think homosexuality, or fear of homosexuality, appeals most notably, noticeably in military contexts in Kubrick's films. Um, now, you can use military in a fairly wide sense here. Um, so it can be, you know, Roman military officers um, and, uh, for example, the bathing scene uh, between Laurence Olivier and Tony Curtis in Spartacus. The, uh, the sexual significance of this scene is quite interesting. There's a big chunk of it. It's, it's, it's basically left out and put on the cutting room floor. You can go through a series of later films which are in homosocial environments. Now, this is an important phrase. The distinction between homosocial and homosexual. So the homosocial is about same-sex friendship. It just means, and it could be homosocial between women, homosocial between men. Um, so same-sex friendship, and it's often used by people who do not want to find a queer reading of the past to explain lots of things away. Oh, they're just guys. They're just, they get a bit drunk. They get a bit friendly. It's not gay. It's not homosexual. It's just high spirits. Um, so you can, for example, when you have footballers rushing around after a match, very excited, hugging and kissing each other, you can say, yeah, there's nothing queer, there's nothing gay about that. That's just simply what ordinary decent boys do when they're kind of overexcited. Perfectly fine. Nothing queer about it. Well, of course, there might be something queer about it, but it's being used as a way of saying we have just friendship, and then somewhere a very long way away in the far distance, we have something called homosexuality. Um, and I've been at conferences where um, I've been trying to explain that my understanding is a bit of a, a spectrum going on here. Just like 
you know, Kinsey came up in the 1940s with the notion that actually there's a very wide range of human behaviour from exclusively homosexual, asexual, inclusively, inclusively heterosexual, and a spectrum in between, right? That similarly speaking, if that's what people are actually like in their sexual preferences, it would be, seem quite bizarre, right? If there wasn't a spectrum between friendship and desire that there was a sudden sort of cleft between a world of friendship that's somehow pure and innocent of sexual desire, and then somewhere over there, a long way over there, there's something called lust. Well, it's quite interesting. I mean, you know, if you want to be a Christian theologian, you can start hypothesizing all these sorts of things. I'm not being rude about Christian theologians, because I also write about history of religion. Um, but if you want to step away from that, you might say that there are other ways of looking at these things. So suggestions, traces. In Dr. Strangelove, um, you could say that a trace of queerness appears in the appearance, the effeteness of um, uh, the character of Mandrake, for example. And it's not just a queerness, it's not just a kind of campness, because he is quite a kind of camp, effeminate character compared with the Americans. And there's clearly a distinction is being made between the effete kind of sort of stereotype of the British being a bit sort of aristocratic and limp as opposed to the aggressive Americans. Um, but it's something that the Americans notice. Mandrake says, I think you're some kind of deviated prevert. And I think General Ripper found out about your preversion and that you are organising some kind of mutiny of preverts. Uh, and this is pretty obviously riffing on the kind of homosexuality scares, the kind of lavender menace uh, rhetoric, uh, which was very prevalent, in, particularly in 50s uh, America. So, as in 2001, as I outlined in my introduction... Uh, well, sorry. As in 2001, um, I think, you know, in 2001... Like in uh, Strange Love and Spartacus, we're not looking for, we don't have to have what I've described somewhere else as a smoking bed. Okay, and I'll explain what I mean by this in a moment. Right. You can have traces, you can have queer traces, you can have queer signs, and there are a lot of them very liberally dotted around, like that quote about preversion and so forth. So what's a smoking bed? Well, the idea is like a smoking gun in a whodunit, in a murder mystery. And the idea is, who did, who killed the person? There is the body lying on the ground. There is someone standing by the body, they're holding a gun, the smoking gun means the smoke is still kind of coming out the end of the gun. Apparently this is what used to happen back in the day, right? <laughs> Don't know where that's how guns work nowadays. But anyway, supposedly smoke comes out the end of the gun and you... The detective arrives on the scene and goes, you know, wow, I don't have to be Hercule Poirot to spot who did it. Except, of course, you know, in the convention of, uh, of whodunits, that's far too easy, and you obviously discover that they're the one person who hasn't done it because it's so obvious. So the smoking bed. And it basically means that there are some people out there, um, some historians, for example, who set the burden of proof for any kind of homosexuality very, very high indeed. In other words, everyone in history is... is slapped with the label of heterosexual uh, until proven, quote, guilty of a sexual act, a homosexual act, or sustained homosexual acts, which you can't explain away. Um, and those homosexual acts have to be pretty obvious. You know, a letter from that person saying they're in love with someone and, you know, they had sex last week or something like that. Now... For fairly obvious reasons, people in the past when homosexual behaviour between men was criminalised in Britain, in the United States, in large parts of, uh, <coughs> of what is now Germany, Austria, um, <coughs> people didn't tend to write down explicit details like that because it's dangerous to do so. 
So if you're going to be a historian, or indeed a film critic looking at the past, uh, of queerness, you have got to. You typically won't get the smoking bed. The one point where you typically get the smoking bed in the historical record is when you have a trial verdict. It's like Oscar Wilde found um, guilty of uh, gross indecency. And there's evidence in the class in the in the courtroom, and he is then convicted. In fact, a lot of what's actually going on in the past is a kind of more implicit reading. And that is exactly what Kubrick is doing here. He's flagging up a sort of flavour, a kind of there's something Something odd, something queer about the lad's locker room culture. A locker room culture which basically doesn't seem to have much interest in women, even if it spends a lot of time boasting about sexual conquests with women. Okay, so we think about priapic and phallic obsessions. Uh, in Dr. Strangelove, from Turgidson's name, turgid meaning engorged, to Ripper's fear of weakness through the loss of his vital bodily fluids, uh, and Mandrake's supposed preversions and campness, and if you want to get into slightly psychoanalytic reading, Kong's phallic nuclear bomb, viewers are treated to a parade of male insecurity about potency. It's very, very phallic, um, and there's a lot of kind of you know, related kind of imagery as well. And the same concerns will surface in Kubrick's later exploration of American militarism in Full Metal Jacket. Now, there are some other places you can look for some kind of comparative uh, studies. There's an interesting book published quite a few years ago by uh, Theolite, which is a groundbreaking study of post-World War I German Freikorps, um, which looked at the kind of boundary between kind of hyper-masculinity and masculine desire. Uh, and particularly, I'm not an expert in this, but in German-speaking countries, there is a tradition. Uh, there was one tradition towards kind of queer uh, homosexual liberation uh, was actually focused upon the notion of brotherhoods of the, uh, of the hyper-masculine. <clears throat> so, but what we have to think about is that in these all-male environments with the obs obsession about strength and hardness and virility and, you know, the turgid, right, um, it's a, a, an uneasy pol political economy. It's insecure. It has to keep... Um, kind of policing its own boundaries because homosexuality is traditionally widely demonised and associated with being an effeminate feminine quality. So there's a kind of locked-in contradiction in some of these all-male environments between the desire for masculinity, which is good in their terms, but you have to somehow not desire men sexually at the same time. Quite challenging to keep those two things apart. Now, one of the things I think is quite interesting is that there, in an earlier film... Ah, uh, oh, yes, OK, sorry, here's a <coughs> phallic cigar going on from... T uh, OK. Uh, in an earlier film, Kubrick gives a softer military context in some ways. The uh, highly, rather ornamental uh, uniforms uh, of Barry Lyndon. Now, one thing I think is quite interesting here is that the film has come in for a certain amount of criticism for the stereotypical and allegedly homophobic depiction of two effete officers who appear to be in love with each other and are overheard by Barry when they are bathing. But I think we can put this in a wider kind of perspective. It's definitely a kind of commentary on queerness and some sort of aspect of same-sex desire. It's also voyeuristic. So one of the things that is you need to be very, we need to, I'm sure you're very well aware of this with Kubrick, is that a lot of what's going on is a kind of, he's thinking about the process of looking. And he's interested about the way that characters look and what they're looking at 
and then how he is seeing that through his camera. So it's like a cascade of seeing. And it's a kind of desire to kind of winkle out secrets and see what might be seen, exploring, if you like, the closet. So it's important to note that I think Kubrick, I think we can say you can probably say he doesn't like these uh, military uh, kind of warrior aristocracies. It's basically, you know, Strange Love is a parody on such things. And th these are a variety of kind of various kind of parodies. But in Barry Lyndon, these two characters express a devotion to each other, which seems to be quite honest and le more honest, perhaps, than in uh, some of the kind of heter heterosexual themes that are actually going on here. And one thing I think is also interesting is, is that this is a theme that was invented, this scene was invented by Kubrick. Um, Thackeray certainly wasn't writing a sort of an obviously, um, in his terms, sodomitical uh, scene between two men into his novel, The Luck of Barry Lyndon. And it's also that's significant that the, its place in the film lies just after the scene in which Barry has kissed on the mouth and sobbed at the death of his best friend, Grogan. A display of emotional connection manifestly lacking from Barry's liaisons with other men. And that just goes back to what I was saying earlier on. You could look at, you know, the kiss on the mouth and the sobbing as it's just friendship. Hmm? And maybe it is just friendship, but maybe actually there's something more to just friendship than initially meets the eye. <clears throat> now, one thing that's also fairly notorious is that in many of Kubrick's other films, including 2001, women do not play a major role. Uh, and I'm very aware that, uh, you know, you could take all sorts of different feminist slants on what Kubrick is doing in these various films, some of which would be enthusiastic and some of which would be less enthusiastic. So what I want to think about is how does Kubrick deal with scenes without women? Now, it's quite interesting because in conventional drama, a lot of the tension is actually based around the supposed essential difference between men and women. I said supposed, right? Okay. Uh, and the kind of notion that somehow communication between planet man and planet woman is going to be incredibly difficult because there's something essentially different between the masculine and the feminine and male desires and female desires. And an awful lot of drama is about how these two can somehow actually communicate with each other. Now, what I'm getting at here is that one of the things you might be seeing in the homosocial environments of certain Kubrick films is the instilling of kind of male and female characteristics within all male environments. And you reproduce the same kind of tensions between more or less masculine men, like, for example, Mandrake and the various male officers. Now that brings me to Hal. Mm. Uh, and obviously, again, something about the 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 uh, the eye. Well, uh, this is fairly obvious stuff, you know. Um, about the, the the way in which this um, it's the eye and seeing and depiction and the way in which you are sometimes seeing through the Hal eye and sometimes back the other way. It's really, really kind of very interesting. Going back to the kind of whole issue about kind of voyeurism. And, and my kind of thinking about Kubrick is not as a man who's, you know, sexually interested in other men, but he's interested in exploring the idea potentially as a dramatic theme. Um, but he's certainly interested in certain forms of sexuality which traditionally might be seen as perverse, such as voyeurism, for example. So what would be quite perverse being a straight man who might find it kind of interesting to oversee, rather like Barry Lyndon, a couple of guys getting it on in the distance, for example. Doesn't make you homosexual, might make you a voyeur. Okay. So let's have a look at 2001 and let's have a think about how 
Now, this is the area of, of 2001 studies where before I, you know, decided to have a go, uh, throw my hand in to, to ha have a look at it, where there had been some chirping about queerness, although the term queer wasn't widely used. Hmm. So it had been noted that his voice had a mildly androgynous tone, that he was initially to have been called Athena after the Greek warrior goddess. There's something quite queer about that because that's a woman who's also a warrior. And Boylan has argued, quotes, that Hal's purpose, quotes, is to take care of humans. He sees to their every need. Open brackets. Well, perhaps not all. Sex being markedly absent from the film. It's quite quite interesting. Um, so there you have a, an academic writing about the film, saying that there's no sex, but it's bringing sex into the viewpoint. Uh, there's something called the elephant in the room. I don't know if you know that phrase, um, but it's something very sort of ostentatiously not there. You can have very significant absences. So, if you have a group of people, uh, well, anyway, so that's something to actually kind of think about. So the servant, Hal's role is to be the perfect servant, as was observed as early as 1971. And what I want to think about here is that there's something a little bit was seemingly perverse about the role of being a servant, a willing servant, as seen in the context of the 1960s, particularly the social revolutions of the 1960s. What kind of person would willingly want to be a servant? Above all, what kind of man would willingly want to be a servant? Think about autonomy, masculinity, the masculine subject. Why would you want to subject yourself to other men? Okay. So there was some preoccupation in the 60s with the perceived perversity of a male who chooses to be in service, as can be seen from the film The Servant, 1963. And this was starring the closeted homosexual Dirk Bogart, who's in, well, he's there looking into that mirror. Um, and um, in the distance, you can see in the mirror James Fox, who's, uh, who's the master of the household. What happens in the film is the role of master and servant is, is inverted, so that the servant actually ends up taking over. Um, the other thing I wanted you to notice is that round mirror and the play of what you can see backwards and forwards through that kind of space, which also evokes the film camera. So indeed, analogously to James Fox's character in the earlier film, film, the ostensible master, Bowman, for example, in 2001, is described as by another academic as reduced to complete dependence on the machine. It looks as though he has submitted completely to it. Now think about that. Complete submission. What's this meant? What does that meant to evoke? Well, I mean, conventionally speaking, if you think about straight male porn, this is one of the fantasies about what women are meant to do to male desire. And so there was, I found all sorts of things, kind of very gossipy innuendo about what might be going on here. So another writer talked about um, the relationship between Paul and Bowman as being like an old married couple who no longer have the need to speak to each other. And someone else commented that when Hal is being disconnected by Bowman, the computer sings the song Daisy Daisy, uh, in which he confesses, I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. Um, and so I kind of, you know, in my paper go on to suggest that there's something of a kind of fag robot thing going on with Hal. Um, and also, this also fits into some of the ideas of the homosexual as rogue, as dangerous, as queer, uh, particularly the kind of the effeminate. And there's, there's quite a long history, by the way, of um, effeminate robots. When you think about, um, you know, what they do with them in, in Star Wars, for example, um, which is actually quite sort of funny. They're either toys or they kind of camp and so forth. So I think that's actually quite interesting. OK. I'm just going to move um, quickly on here because I'm aware that we're running sort of somewhat <laughs> late. Um, so what I would say is that there are quite a lot of other 
points uh, which could be made in relation to these things, which we don't really have time to go through here. Um, but I'm very happy to answer questions on this, or indeed to, you can email me. You can find my uh, email address quite easily at Keel University in the UK to ask further questions about some of these things. Uh, one of the things I think is also quite useful, and I haven't really talked about this very much, is casting. So, for example, hmm, Kia Dahlia. So, Kubrick watched all of Dahlia's movies and cast him without an audition. This, said the actor during the promotional tour for 2001, gave him a chance to play someone, but perhaps not that, someone different, but perhaps not that different, from the introverted, new to young boy with parent problems, usually his mother. <laughs> And he made a whole series of films where he played rather kind of queer characters. Um, for example, in Bunny Lake is Missing, 1965, Dahlia played Stephen, um, whose niece is the one who goes missing. The police inspector is played by the bisexual Laurence Olivier, who we may remember back from Spartacus. Um, the inf inspector investigates both Stephen, who appears to suffer from incestuous desires, so perversity, preversion, right, uh, and his sister's landlord, who's played by the famously homosexual Noel Coward as a whip-loving sadomasochist. So Dahlia had a track record of playing characters who were psychologically disturbed, prone to confrontations with male violence, and, and also to repressing their feelings. So kind of a type of paranoid closet queen, you could say, or as seen from the point of view of the 1960s. And I want you to actually think about some other queer casting um, that Kubrick did. So, for example, uh, his selection of Murray Melvin to play the effeminate Reverend Runt in Barry, Barry Lyndon bearing in mind that Melvin had first come to prominence playing Jeffrey, a camp and openly homosexual youth that was so daring about this film, in Sheila Delaney's play, A Taste of Honey, uh, which was reprised in the film version of 1961. Um, now, this is quite interesting, this character, the Reverend Runt, because it's playing on two different things. It's playing between the notion of effeminacy as simply weakness and the kind of implication that there might be of homosexuality behind this. There's quite a long history um, in British culture of ambiguity between those two areas. So in 18th century studies, there's a theatre type called a fop. And there is much debate about whether the fop is simply, in inverted commas, a weakly, effeminate, runtish man, who's like an inferior kind of man, but is simply an inferior man, or is actually inferior because he's a like a woman and therefore implicitly shares the desires of women implicitly for men. But I think the fact that Kubrick had picked him to play an effeminate, after he had become famous for playing an openly gay character, means that you are actually expected to pull out same-sex desire from this, not just simply effeminacy. I'm just going to go through final kind of five minutes here. Okay. So, I think that one of the one of the other characteristics I think that I really want to kind of focus on and just kind of finish off here is what Kubrick is doing in his I think what he's doing is he's queering a variety of types of masculinity. What he's basically saying, I think, amongst other things, is that it's much too easy just to say there's an effeminate man over there that's the obvious homosexual he's thinking in Kinsey terms he's thinking in radical 1960s terms about sexual diversity in the population he's also you know, as a straight guy right? he's also thinking about same sex environments and wondering whether there's something queer and strange actually going on there and I think is kind of looking at hyper-masculinity 
as being, you know, guys arguing a little bit too hard for their own good. But actually, these are people who have something to hide. So I want to give you a couple, just to leave you, finish here with a couple of kind of examples of queer viewing of kind of hyper-masculinity. So, for example, Andy Warhol in his Superman 1961, which can be read as emblematic of his swishy camp pop art reaction against heterosexual, you know, masculine culture amongst um, abstract expressionists. And one of the things that queer readings have, of, uh, uh, of this have focused on is the... Uh, you distract from the, you know, the hyper-masculine body to the word puff. And a puff uh, was, for a very long time, a word for a... It's a, a puff of air, but it's also the word for an effeminate homosexual. And it's a term that originated in the 18th century, by the way. And they were playing on the two meanings of homosexual... Well, queer meanings of the word puff right the way back in the 18th century as well. So it's very well known. Um, and then when I want to think about, well, let's think about Full Metal Jacket. Hyper male soldiers shouted at, accused of being faggots, asked if they suck dick and challenged to admit that they are Peter Puffers. So what does that mean when you're presented with that, when Kubrick puts that in front of you? One of the things you're going to think is, are they? So, this is problematizing uh, male strength and masculinity. And here are, well, we'll be seeing some potential Peter Parthers later on. Now, I want to finish off with this. this the monolith. I mean, you know, in terms of being not being told clearly what it is, this is right up there. It's a big slab of something or other. It's meant to be enigmatic. That's part of its power. One of the things I do that I did with this was to look at Clark's original ideas for what the monolith was. And in the early drafts of the story, um, there are a whole series of um, previous versions of the monolith, basically. And in one, there's one. Uh, point where um, Kubrick is kind of right sorry Clark is writing jokingly about imagining uh, a group of kind of monoliths kind of driving up uh, a street in I think it was in New York kind of showing off like guys showing off if you think about this as a body if you think of it as the epitome of hardness of unfemininity it's potentially a symbol of kind of hyper-masculinity. Uh, yeah, here we go. So, uh, it's, it's, yeah. so in, in May 13th, 1964, uh, Clark... Actually, it was Kubrick's idea. Sorry, I'd missed this. In 1964, Clark noted that Kubrick had had the, hil quotes, the hilarious idea of 17 aliens, featureless black pyramids riding in open cars down Fifth Avenue like a, co a convoy of military or political dignitaries. So actually, mm, it's actually both Clark and Kubrick seeing this image as a bit like, you know, su the super guy, the ultimate super guy, the superman, actually. Right? Who's going to transform human society? So, what happens right at the end of 2001? Well, we don't know. <laughs> it's very, very hard to know what happens at the end of 2001. And oh, by the way, I just want to show you this image. So, in the 1950s, uh, science fiction magazine, one of the covers, and this is by a queer artist. Um, basically showed a kind of monolith-like thing shooting into space, which actually has naked male bodies kind of emerging, kind of coming in and out of it. Um, and you want to, you can, th I have various other arguments about architecture and so forth and the phallic nature of architecture. I want to finish with this. And what the hell is going on at the end of 2001? We don't know. We are not clearly told. And so this invites different readings, different things. And I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts all right, it happens in a bedroom. It's a very strange bedroom, but it happens in a bedroom. Um, 
and you've got a guy in a bed and you've got the monolith. You've heard what I've said the monolith might be. Symbol of kind of hypermasculinity. What emerges from this is, this is the birth of the star child. Now, there's a whole other area which is talking about desire towards children and Clark, which I don't want to get into right now. But I do want to think about reproduction. Somehow, what seems to happen at the end of 2001 is an extraordinary kind of reproduction. It involves a guy in a room, ageing, dying, and either being reborn or generating a new being in some way in association with the monolith. It doesn't involve women. So if we think about that, it's deeply odd. It's deeply strange. And bearing in mind what I've said hitherto, I think it's also deeply queer. So what I'm giving you there with a queer reading of 2001 A Space Odyssey is not a complete explanation of the film. But it's a provocation. But I would argue it's not a provocation that I have brought in from my queer planet to a film which is pure of these things. It's a film which is saturated with opportunity for, for that kind of reading. And once you've done that with 2001, I think you can also do that with a whole series of other Kubrick films. Um, so I'll be interested to hear what you think about this, but also what you think about Full Metal Jacket, which we're going to see afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominic, for this contribution. I think there will be some comments, remarks, questions for our presenter for tonight before we have a short break and start with screening. Are there any comments, questions so far for Dominic James and his queer reading of 2001 A Space Odyssey and many more Kubrick films? Please just give me a short uh, sign because we're recording this event, tonight's event as well for our YouTube channel. And the mic will come to you. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. It's more a methodological point because for your argumentation, you always um, need some um, cultural context and material, um, as you uh, uh, even said, um, so, so what, which is in a certain way um, external to an um, internal analysis of the structure of what we can see. So, and then you, in a certain way, have to say something about the uh, author's intention and uh, the cultural context. And I, I'm, I'm very interested about the point um, um, in, uh, whether you can make it um, so in, internal uh, of, of, the, of the structure of the movie. And then um, with this enigmatic um, monolith um, in, the, in the Space Odyssey, it will be a little bit more difficult, um, I would say, because um, then you can even say there's a kind of negativity or undeterminacy, and we can have a diff different um, interpretation of this structure. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I think that's a, ver that's a, ver that's a very good point. Um, so what I would say is that there isn't a conflict here because um, there are two levels in which you can approach this, and it's, uh, you can approach it because of the the fact that the word queer can be used in different ways. So in other words, you can, there is academic study which in, uh, which in the English and American tradition uses queer specifically to refer to same-sex desire. Uh, and then there's other uses of it which are much less directly related to individual sexual expression and sexual desire, or indeed sexual identity. So my suggestion is that you can play well so you can take the background context 
a lot of which is actually more specific than you might think, right, um, in relation to, you know, what Clark was doing and all this kind of stuff. And then you can say to yourself, well, imagine uh, we're going to use the word queer in this way. What might, it, what might emerge in a reading of this final scene? Or if we use it in another way, what might emerge? So I'll give you an example. If you wanted to use a kind of a strong reading using the word queer of this last scene, you could say that, you know, you have kind of two characters in a bedroom and then there is a kid is produced. And that this actually is some kind of pretty much pointing to some kind of sex scene with a kind of reproduction that is beyond our technology and it doesn't involve women. Right? Um, in which point you are hypothesising something deeply sexually queer because it's about sexuality and reproduction in some way. Or you can use the word queer in a much softer kind of a way to say that um, in the context of its time a scene which is ending the film about reproduction, you definitely expect a woman to be around somewhere, and there isn't one, and that therefore that is a kind of queer sign of the absence of woman, for example. You see what I'm saying? So you can be more direct about same sexes are, or less direct, uh, and uh, in terms of arguing within the film internally, um, of course, you know, if you can argue both of those, can either of those convincingly, then they would be equally valid readings. Other questions, comments to Dominic Jaynes? Well, I, I think, I mean, the only thing, I know you've been sort of listening to me for a long time, so if I could just put in another sort of like one minute or something like that. That's true. Yeah, um, unless, did you, I don't know if you had a question. You no, I mean, to, I was yeah. just uh, wondering about if you had some further remarks maybe um, for Full Metal Jacket as you chose the, the picture for tonight's screening. And I think, of course, there's a lot to say about um, Kubrick's second last film, um, which we are going to see in a couple of minutes. Mm. But you've already hinted upon some, some yeah, facts. Maybe yeah, there are some, yeah, some further yeah, remarks yeah. on that. Yeah. So I think, well, one other thing which I haven't really talked about here is satire um, and caricature and, and exaggeration. Um, so one of, my, one of my books is called Oscar Wilde Prefigured. Um, and it's basically about the character of the, the queer dandy before Oscar Wilde. It's basically saying Oscar Wilde wasn't the first known to be queer dandy. Um, and I focused on using caricature. So what I think is a useful framework to use with a lot of Kubrick films is to focus on humour, upon satire, and the sense of a satire and parody on homosexual, aggressive, um, homosocial aggressive life so I think you get that it's much more subtle I think in 2001 it's there but it's much more subtle but you get it very strongly in, two, in, in, um, in Dr. Strangelove and you also get it very strongly in Full Metal Jacket and I think one of the things that you need to think about there is the, the implications of criticising the American military um, in the post-war period and in the context of the Cold War and what that actually implies politically about questioning you know, the virility of American manhood and holding that up to parody. And so I think what Kubrick is doing is... On the one hand, um, f you know, he's showing his kind of fascination with these, uh, with these areas, but he's also finding ways to draw a sense of humour out of male insecurities. So even if he's not saying to you, oh, look, uh, a lot of these guys are fags, which he might be saying in certain places, he's actually saying there are a bunch of straight guys who are completely obsessed and worried 
that they might be seen as fags. And that's why they're behaving in, in this kind of exaggerated way. So he's actually using aspects of queerness to critique, I guess, kind of exaggerated normative masculinity. So that's one of, one of the fun things. And also the final thing I'll just say is focus on pleasure. This is one other thing, right, which I think queer studies should be good at, and it isn't always, is focusing on the sense of pleasure and the sense of fun, the kind of perverse fun that Kubrick often has, um, playing, toying with his characters. And that's another thing I think quite strongly about him. I think there's a kind of sadistic quality, actually, with the way that he treats a lot of his characters, and sometimes the way he treats his audience we have to sit there for a very long time to get those final climaxes in 2001. So I would say get ready for perverse pleasures. <laughs> Thank you again. Yeah. Uh, Dominic Jaynes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for this fruitful contribution and provocation, as you put it. And um, we are now having a short break. We will just have a five minute break and we will ring the bell again after the break so that you know when we will start with the screening of Full Metal Jacket in a couple of minutes. Short minute break now and uh, we will be back uh, just in an instant. <laughs>